Uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the inaugural Mason Conversation brought to you by the Gilbert and Tobin Centre of Public Law and UNSW Law. Uh, my name is Sean Brennan and I'm the Director of the Gilbert and Tobin Centre of Public Law. Uh, thank you for joining us tonight and a particular thanks to those of you who've uh, travelled here on a midweek night to Kensington. Uh, can I please ask you to uh, turn off your phone or turn them to silent? Uh, if you haven't already. I begin by acknowledging that we're on the traditional land of Aboriginal people today. I acknowledge and pay my respects to the Bidjigal people and the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, the traditional owners of the land on which the Sydney campuses of the University of New South Wales are located and I pay my respects to the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people uh, here with us tonight. I'm very proud to welcome you to this event. As the word inaugural suggests, the Gilbert and Tobin Centre intends to make this a, a series held at the law school each year. Our centre's always placed a high priority on engagement uh, with government, the legal profession, the judiciary, the private sector, other academic and public policy institutions, and especially through events like this uh, with students and the general public. And we have people from all those communities here tonight. Uh, we want to provide a platform through the centre where people can hear and engage with great speakers reflecting on important issues from history, from our present day circumstances, and for our future. Uh, through the lens of public law. That's why we've crafted this event as a conversation. Uh, it will allow a prominent figure to exchange their experiences and perspectives uh, with an onstage uh, moderator uh, before we expand the dialogue to include members of the audience. We're absolutely delighted about two things in relation to this annual series of public conversations. The first is that Sir Anthony Mason agreed to us naming it in his honour. And the second is that he accepted our invitation to be the first conversationalist uh, at the inaugural event. Sir Anthony will be a stranger to none of you, but I will formally introduce him in a moment. But first, I wanted to acknowledge Lady Patricia Mason and a number of other members of the Mason family uh, who are joining us here tonight. Thank you and a warm welcome to you all. Uh, I would also like to acknowledge um, uh, another distinguished former Chief Justice of the High Court, uh, a colleague for many years of Sir Anthony and a generous supporter of, of legal scholarship who indeed gave the Hal Wooten lecture in this theatre in 2012, Sir Gerard Brennan. Up until this morning, he was intending to be here uh, he very much regrets that illness has prevented that and we very much regret his absence and acknowledge him and his contribution. I also wanted to introduce Sir Anthony's partner in conversation for the first part of tonight's event, Professor George Williams. George is of course a Scientia Professor of Law here at UNSW and was the Foundation Director of the Gilbert and Tobin Centre of Public Law from its inception in 2001 until 2008 as well as a leading scholar nationally and internationally in areas of public law such as human rights, constitutional law, counter-terrorism and electoral law. Uh, George is a prominent figure in the media with a regular opinion column in Fairfax outlets that I'm sure many of you read. Uh, he's written and edited a rather gobsmacking total of 34 books. Uh, he's appeared as a barrister in public law cases and conducted or participated in a number of major public policy processes for state and territory governments. George is a champion of public engagement by legal academics and of course is in an excellent position to advance that cause uh, these days in his new position as Dean of UNSW Law since June this year, at a time when the university under its new Vice-Chancellor Ian Jacobs is placing more emphasis than ever uh, before on external engagement. Uh, by the university. George has had more than one uh, association with our guest tonight. His professorship at this university 
is in fact named after Sir Anthony, and George also worked as an associate to Justice Michael McHugh at the High Court when Sir Anthony was Chief Justice. In the year um, 1992, uh, that the court handed down some of its landmark decisions in cases such as Mabo against Queensland number two, that recognised the pre-existing rights to land of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, and ACTV against the Commonwealth, the political broadcasting decision that recognised an implied freedom of political communication in the Australian Constitution. And so to our distinguished guest on the stage, if you've had any cause to examine the course of Australian law, and especially judge-made law, in the past 40 years, then the chances are you are familiar with the work of Sir Anthony Mason. As a student at law school, my own legal education through the 1980s came increasingly under the forceful influence of Sir Anthony as he reshaped Australian thinking, uh, not just about legal doctrine in a variety of areas we learnt about, public law, private law and many others, but also Australian thinking about how we perceive the High Court and its role in our system of government. Later as a teacher and researcher in the area of public and constitutional law in particular, I find myself and observe colleagues and indeed members of the High Court reaching for the judgments of Sir Anthony from the 1970s to the mid-1990s regularly for their prescience, uh, their aerial perspective, uh, their incisive analysis and their lucid expression. I was struck in the run-up to the event by a number of colleagues uh, outside my own field uh, who spoke to me about the contributions Sir Anthony had made in their specialist areas of the law in terms of technically acute and reform-minded development of the common law. And it was no surprise to us that once we advertised this event, the registrations began flooding in. The Honourable Sir Anthony Mason, ACKBE GBM, was born in April 1925. After serving in the RAAF in World War II, he graduated from the University of Sydney with first class honours in arts and law, and he subsequently joined the Sydney Bar in 1951. He was appointed a Justice of the High Court of Australia in 1972 and was Chief Justice from 1987 to his retirement in 1995. Prior to that, he'd served as a judge of the Court of Appeal in New South Wales and as Solicitor General for the Commonwealth. After his retirement from the High Court, Sir Anthony was a non-permanent judge of the Hong Kong Court of Final Appeal from 1997 to very recently in 2015. Here at UNSW, Sir Anthony was Chancellor of the University, uh, only the fifth person to occupy that office. Sir Anthony and his family have continued a strong association uh, uh, with this university since then, and in particular, I must acknowledge uh, Sir Anthony's role as chair of the Gilbert and Tobin Centre's advisory committee and the invaluable support and advice he's provided to me and my predecessors as director of the centre. He's been particularly generous uh, to the young and emerging scholars in our public law community. He's expressed that commitment through a financial grant uh, awarded each semester to support postgraduate research, uh, that pursuit of a PhD, of course, being a, a low-income activity in a very high-cost city, it also finds intellectual expression in a variety of other ways, including meeting with students individually, providing feedback about their projects, and regularly attending our biennial postgraduate workshop. Very few law schools are so lucky as to have such an authoritative and at the same time such a generous contributor to the development of its emerging scholars. My final observation is that we're here midweek on the Kensington campus during term time. That was a deliberate decision on our part. Uh, Sir Anthony was very keen, as we were, that this event be readily accessible to students. And so to you, uh, the UNSW graduates of the future who are here, welcome, and it's great to see so many of you here. Uh, Sir Anthony was once a law student too, uh, which is, if you think about it, a bit of an inspiration for us all. Uh, I believe that's where George may well take us early on. And without further ado, I ask you to join me in welcoming our moderator, Professor George Williams, and our special guest in conversation, Sir Anthony Mason.
Well, thank you very much, Sean. Uh, my job is to start the conversation going and then there'll be time for people to ask questions um, a bit later. Uh, Sir Anthony, as Sean has said, you were born in 1925, uh, between the wars, a very different era, a very different time in Australia. Could you tell us a bit about your schooling, your childhood, and what, were, what was it about those things that led you to the decision to uh, yourself become a lawyer? Uh, well, uh, we occupied uh, a waterfront property in Darling Point, Yarran Abbey, uh, in Yarran Abbey Road, Darling Point, uh, when I was a boy. Um, as a result, I went to schools in the eastern suburbs, starting with a primary, kindergarten primary school in Double Bay, then Kincoppel Convent, which was then situated in Elizabeth Bay, separate from the Rose Bay Convent, and after that, Cranbrook School, and finally, Sydney Grammar School. Uh, apart from uh, an incident that I will recall uh, later, my schooling didn't have any impact at all uh, on my decision to become a barrister. Uh, my decision to become a barrister was made for me by my mother. And as early as I can remember, she said to me, you are going to become a barrister. <laughs> now, the reason for that was she had a cousin whom she admired greatly. She was a New Zealander, and her cousin was Sir Arthur Fair, who became Solicitor General of New Zealand, and later a judge and finally acting Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of New Zealand. So she wanted me to follow in his footsteps. Um, her suggestion for my future was encouraged by my uncle, a brother of my father, uh, who was a barrister in Sydney and ult ultimately became a leading King's Counsel in Sydney. Um, now, uh, the incident that I referred to uh, was, in fact, the time when I was moved from Cranbrook School to Sydney Grammar School. Uh, the reason for that was uh, that my uncle thought that Sydney Grammar School had produced more lawyers than any other school in Sydney. And in fact, he was right. Two of the first three judges of the High Court of Australia, the original judges, uh, were educated at Sydney Grammar School. So for that reason, uh, and another reason of geographical proximity, I moved from Cranbrook to Sydney Grammar School. Uh, my education, I think, was quite unremarkable, except for one occurrence when I was at Sydney Grammar School. The senior maths master came in one day. He'd marked some examination papers, and he commenced the class by saying, Mason, your results are very disappointing. Uh, they say fish is good for the brain. I advise you to eat a whale for breakfast every morning. <laughs> now, at the time, I knew that a, a whale was not a fish, but a mammal. <laughs> and I thought to myself, well, the class has laughed heartily at this joke at my expense. Should I point this out to it? And I thought to myself, well, Discretion is the better part of valour. He may hold it against me if I show up his ignorance in front of the class. So uh, I didn't point it out. Um, but as I say, the decision to become a barrister was really a decision made for me by my mother. And a couple of things from that. You don't mention your father, who was, of course, a surveyor. Was he a willing accomplice in this plan? And what about yourself? Was this, was this path that was mapped out for you something that you willingly followed? Well, first of all, as far as my father was concerned, uh, later on he did say to me, are you sure you want to become a barrister because you can take over my practice in due course as a surveyor? And my response to that was to say that I wanted to become a barrister. Uh, now, I don't want to convey the impression that my mother was some sort of dictatorial ogre. She was the very converse of that. She was a, a loving, affectionate person. Uh, but I went along with it. It seemed to me that to be a barrister was a pretty good thing. And I've never changed my mind about that, George, except perhaps being a judge is an even better thing. And you enlisted uh, during World War II and the RAAF. Was, was that uh, just an interruption to the plans that you had or something that you felt the well, need to do uh, at the time? Uh, ultimately, it wasn't an interruption because I was only in the Air Force for 
uh, about 20 months altogether, 20, 21 months. And unfortunately, although I told my wife that I was a war hero, I'm far <laughs> from being a war hero. I succeeded in doing my training as a navigator, but the Germans never suffered any destruction at my hands and I was never at risk during the war. Uh, I trained overseas in Canada, North America, and I spent uh, quite some time there and then I came back to Australia. And they didn't have heavy bombers for which I was trained to navigate back here. So I luxuriated as a flying officer in the RAAF without doing anything excepting Except accepting my pay for some time. <laughs> but I did manage to enlist in second year arts while I was still in the Air Force. And I managed to complete second year arts between or roughly the end of August and December in that year. And then, of course, immediately after the war, you, uh, you started your law studies at the University of Sydney. You didn't have a choice, of course, for the University of New South Wales at that point, there being no law school. <laughs> available to, uh, to choose from here. Can you tell us a bit about your experiences? What was it like to be a, a law student at the University of Sydney immediately after World War II? Well, that was in 1946. Now, before the war, at the University of Sydney Law School, I think they put through about 40 people a year, 40 students a year, at the most graduated. Uh, in 1946, the class was over 300 in first year. They consisted mainly of ex-service people, a lot of them mature ex-service people older than myself. Um, and uh, the surprising thing to a student today would be that th there were, I think, no more than about 10 females in that class of 300. Um, as far as the lecturers were concerned, uh, they were mainly practicing lawyers. A number of them were practicing barristers and a few practicing solicitors. There were very few academics. Uh, Professor Julius Stone was a notable academic, as was uh, Professor Morrison. They were two very good lecturers, and I think both of them influenced me. Uh, the other lecturer who I thought was outstanding was uh, John Holmes, who was a practicing barrister, ultimately became um, a Queen's Counsel and a member of the New South Wales Court of Appeal. Uh, and was a judge of that court at the same time that I became a judge of the court. Uh, but he was a very good lecturer and he was responsible for my continuing interest ever since in constitutional law. Mm. And by the way, the lecturers talked at you. They didn't invite any discussion as you <laughs> people do these days. Um, and some of them were not very good. And <laughs> Well, some things have changed, I hope. But, uh... yeah, yeah. And you will like this remark, George. I did say, and this is an unfair comment, that I did well in law, notwithstanding my education at Sydney University. <laughs> but as I say, that's a quite unfair comment. <laughs> and of course, after, uh, after leaving university, you quite quickly went to the bar, you achieved your aspiration. I, I wonder how you found that as a young barrister. And, and how it formed your own view of uh, what you thought the law was for in our society? Uh, well, I enjoyed being a barrister. Um, I had a lot of good fortune as a barrister. Uh, I got work from the Commonwealth Crown and the State Crown uh, from almost the beginning of my career at the bar. Uh, I remember one brief I got was a series of briefs in prosecutions arising out of a royal commission into the liquor industry in New South Wales. There were about six prosecutions and I was the second junior. The leading counsel for us was Bill Dovey who was Gough Whitlam's father-in-law and Gough Whitlam was the first junior but as he had parliamentary responsibilities they needed a second junior who'd do some research so I got into it and then uh, one of the cases I had when I was about three years at the bar was the Queen and, Dav Queen and Davison, which is reported in the CLR, and I won this constitutional case on a simple point. It was just waiting to be won, actually. Um, but that got me <laughs> off to a good start. <laughs> and I, I imagine for much of your time as a barrister, the, the leading figure of the New South Wales bar would have been Garfield Barwick. Was he someone you appeared with or against on many occasions? Yes, indeed in the cases, the prosecution cases I was referring to, he appeared against us. Um, and in fact, 
His brother was one of the defendants in one of the prosecutions. He, uh, I think, was the licensee of a hotel, the Captain Cook Hotel, near the cricket ground, very close to this university. And were there, were there particular figures, whether it be Barwick or other barristers, that, that you felt you learnt a lot from at the bar in particular? Well, I certainly learnt a lot from Sir Garfield Barwick. He was an outstanding advocate in his day. I've never heard a better advocate. Uh, he was tenacious and had a very agile mind. Uh, and I learned a lot from uh, Ken Asprey, uh, who was the employer of my wife. Um, when he was uh, at the bar before he became a judge, I read with him and I learned a great deal from him. He was of great assistance to me, mainly in providing a wife for me. But. <laughs> And do any particular decisions stand out during your time as a barrister in terms of shaping your own outlook? I mean, such as the, the Queen, as Queen and Richard's... Well, that case in particular, um, that had a big effect on me. Uh, I was asked to appear for Brown and Fitzpatrick, who are alleged to have been guilty of contempt, contempt of Parliament. I sought leave to appear before the Privileges Committee of Parliament, uh, and that was refused. They were both cross-examined by members of the committee, uh, they had on the committee uh, Josky, who was the Queen's counsel from Victoria, but at no stage were they warned about uh, incriminating questions, the possibility of answers incriminating them. Uh, and ultimately, the committee found them guilty. They came before Parliament itself. Uh, Fitzpatrick asked for permission for me to address Parliament. The Speaker refused that with the assent of all the members of Parliament. And I concluded from that that the protection of individual rights, in particular due process, was much better left in the hands of judges than it was in the hands of politicians. Included in the Parliament at that time were two of Australia's outstanding lawyers, Sir Robert Menzies and uh, Dr Evatt as well as uh, Gough Whitlam. But these people were convicted uh, without legal representation, without a charge being formula formulated against them, and eventually in Parliament, all they were allowed to do was to address on the question of penalty. And after, after your period at the bar, you, uh, well, actually while you are at the bar, you became, of course, Solicitor General of the Commonwealth for six years, the, the second most senior law officer of the Commonwealth. Uh, why did you make the decision to take that role and, and how did that role help shape your view of the law? Well, I thought uh, it would be a great experience to become Solicitor General of the Commonwealth. Indeed, if you asked me today uh, what is the best legal job in the country, I think I would say Solicitor General for the Commonwealth, and I'm inclined to think that my successors would give a similar answer. Uh, mind you, the job is more important today than it was then because there's far more litigation that the Commonwealth is involved in than was the case in those days, uh, and there's far more constitutional law and administrative law, for example. Um, but. Uh, and I'll speak about this at another event that the university is holding. Um, I mean, it wasn't easy because I was the first Solicitor General appointed under the Law Officers Act of 1942, and was, it was a matter of establishing satisfactory relations with the department. Uh, and I think I succeeded in doing that. And so you describe it as arguably the best law job in the country. Uh, what was it about that, that you thought was so good? Well, first of all, it offers fascinating work. It offers fascinating cases in which to appear. I had done quite a bit of work for the Commonwealth and for the State Crown before in constitutional and public law cases. And I think uh, government activity is extraordinarily interesting. Um, the way policy is informed, the way policy is implemented, uh, how that translates into legal questions, giving advice on important legal questions, and ultimately appearing in court. And, and despite the fact that it was such a good job, you decided at the age of about 44 in 1969 to accept judicial appointment in New South Wales. 
Um, was there a reason why you felt it was time to move on from yes, that Yes, I thought it was time to move on. I'd been there for over five years, and uh, this may not sound altogether acceptable to everyone here, but I was ambitious. And uh, I thought, in terms of ultimate appointment to the High Court, uh, it would do me no harm to be associated with the state judiciary. Uh, and if you look back on it, uh, over the, all the intervening years, there's only one other Solicitor General for the Commonwealth who's been appointed to the High Court, and that is Stephen Gagler. And, uh, well, of course, your strategy worked. Uh, three years later, you were appointed to the High Court. Most bench. strategies don't work, but this one uh, <laughs> This one, this did, one it did. paid off. Yeah. <laughs> and in 1972, you were appointed to the High Court. Um, from both of these appointments, I mean, was it ambition, of course, but was there any, any reluctance to leave the bar? I mean, given that you had had the aspiration of being a barrister, were you comfortable in making the transition to the bench? Uh, yes, but um, I was more, as it were, reluctant about leaving the bar and becoming Solicitor General because in those days, the term of the appointment was that you were required to live in Canberra. Not so today, but you were then. So I had to ensure that my wife uh, agreed with my removal to Canberra, and she has always taken the opportunity, uh, which may not be uh, an attitude approved of by everyone today, that if your wife's career means moving, you move. And although I'm sure it entailed some hardship on her part, she agreed to go to Canberra. But one thing I did miss was the camaraderie of the bar. Uh, and that's a very significant factor in the life of a, of a barrister. Mm. And at that point that you're appointed to the High Court, which is uh, well, about the age of 47, I mean, that's very young compared to how many, the age many people are appointed to the High Court these days, as early as the late, the early, the early 60s uh, on occasion now. Did you come to the bench at that point with a, a sense of what you saw the role of the judge was? Were you... Did you feel as if that you had a clear sense of the direction in which you wanted to propel the law? Well, I had some sense, but by no means a complete sense. And my own view about judges is that judges develop a philosophy, a judicial philosophy, uh, in the course of being a judge. I don't think they come to the bench with a predisposition. Some cases they might. I have no doubt that Sir Owen Dixon did. But the majority, no. Now, uh, I had some views, but they were not completely shaped. First of all, uh, I thought that uh, Australian jurisprudence emanating from the High Court of the day and past High Courts was too legalistic, and I thought that uh, there was room for policy uh, argumentation and reasoning in judgment. Uh, I also had views about Section 92, uh, that were by no means congenial to Sir Garfield Barwick, who was the Chief Justice when I was appointed. And I think it is probably true to say that over my time on the court, um, I was inclined to undermine the accepted philosophy behind the reasoning on Section 92 uh, and to promote a different approach. Um, I, I tried a couple of approaches, actually. But the second one was one that ultimately prevailed in Colin Whitfield. And I, I imagine that Sir Garfield must have been a champion of your appointment, given he was, of course, Chief Justice at that point. Do you, do you think your approach in that area or others would have been a disappointment to him? Oh, certainly. But I'm not so sure. I'm not so sure that you're right in saying he was a champion of my appointment. Uh, my own feeling was that he would have preferred to have a, had appointed. Uh, Nigel Bowen, mm -hmm. uh, who was then the Liberal member for Parramatta and who ultimately became Liberal opposition leader and who was an outstanding lawyer and who became uh, Attorney General sometime after I was appointed Solicitor General. And I thought he was an outstanding Attorney General. 
And you talked in your answer about wanting to develop the law away from some of the more legalistic approaches, which of course were very much in vogue at that point. I mean, where did that come from in terms of your back end and cribs? You've talked about the University of Sydney, a very traditional background that led itself to a particular view of the law, but you came to the court with quite a different view to what might have been expected. Yes, it's difficult to identify the precise origin of that, but it wouldn't be removed from uh, the classes of Professor Julius Stone that I attended at Sydney University. He was what they called a sociological uh, jurisprudence advocate. Uh, I would be inclined to regard him more as a functional jurisprudential advocate rather than a sociological one. But I can, I can understand the, the, the alternative description. Mm. It was interesting because you talked about your University of Sydney experience and perhaps how you're on a pre almost a predetermined path to the bar and perhaps that educational experience hadn't had as big as impact as we might have thought. But at least in this area, it sounds like it re-emerged. I re -emerged. think so, yes. Mm. Yeah. Uh, when you, of course, joined the High Court, you very soon afterwards found a change of government. The Whitlam, the Whitlam government was elected later in 1972. And a few years later, you found yourself involved in the 1975 dismissal um, by way of advising Governor-General Sir John Kerr. And you've put on the record in a very detailed statement in 2012, published in the Fairfax newspapers, your recollection of conversations with Sir John. I just wonder, with the benefit of hindsight, do you have any regrets about your involvement in those events, or do you think that you should have taken a different approach? Well, my answer to that question would be, with the benefit of hindsight, I would have taken a different approach. Um, certainly when I commenced discussion of this question with Sir John in September of 1975, I didn't foresee the very considerable controversy that subsequently arose. And of course, uh, you've put your statement out there which sets out in great detail your recollection of events, but but haven't wanted to engage after that in terms of books and other things? Is that simply because you, you put all of that material on the public record? Well, I thought so. I thought having regard to my position, the proper approach for me to take was to set out the facts of my relationship with Sir John Kerr and leave it to other people to make their comments uh, for or against uh, participation by judges in advising the Governor-General. Mm. So I've not sought in any way to become, as it were, a competent, a competent in public discussion. And your, your time on the High Court was marked by very much longevity, amongst other things. You spent a very long period of time as a judge, uh, more than a couple of decades. And did you have a sense, as a judge, of your own views of the law developing during that period of time? Certainly. And were there particular influences or events that led you to change your perspective on the role of a High Court judge? Uh, no. I, well, I suppose it developed over time. I can't think of particular events that caused me to, as it were, develop a view or change a view. Um, but I suppose I can say this, that... Um, it became increasingly apparent to me that legislatures around Australia were not much concerned with keeping the law up to date. And therefore, I thought that, as a consequence, there was a responsibility on the court to do something about that. And there, there were some external events that, um, I think, facilitated that. First of all, the appeal to the Privy Council from the High Court was abolished, so the High Court became the supreme adjudicator on the law in Australia. Um, on top of that, uh, the new procedure for special leave as a condition of every appeal to the High Court was introduced, and that necessarily focused uh, the attention of the court on questions of fundamental principle um, and therefore, I think, induced a judicial attitude of mind you know, are we concerned with reshaping fundamental principle or should we just accept the fundamental principle that has been handed down to us by the English courts? Uh, they were the external events that I think were significant. And uh, in terms of communicating your own perception of the need for change, development in the law, 
Did you consciously use speeches as a justice and chief justice as one way of reaching a broader audience? Sometimes, yes. Uh, I thought the Wilfred Fuller lecture I gave in Melbourne on the eve of being appointed Chief Justice of the High Court was one such case. And then later on, <coughs> excuse me, I thought it was necessary to defend or justify the court's decisions in some respects, Marbo number two being a prime example of that. Um, but overall, I think we were acting in accordance with two profound statements made by Sir William Windia. Uh, one related to the common law when he said that judges had uh, a creative responsibility uh, to make, the sure, make sure the common law applied to new developments and even in some degree to develop the common law. And then he made his famous statement in the payroll tax case where he explained the decision in the engineer's case by saying that at the end of World War II, shortly before the engineer's case was decided, that uh, Australia for the first time had a sense that it was one nation, one people, uh, and that there was a national identity. And he said that really explained the decision in the engineer's case. Now, lawyers may disagree with that, but that's what he said. And I was always very impressed by those two statements he made. And in your own writing style, which, I mean, as a judge, has always been marked by clarity and directness when it comes to setting out legal principle and identifying the reasons for decision, were you conscious of a desire to expound the law in a similar way to what you've described, or do you have a particular approach that you're trying to take in your judgment writing? Uh, yes, well, I always thought it was important um, uh, to write clearly, and I always thought it was important to avoid the use of metaphors. Uh, I think metaphorical examples given by judges in judgments have invariably proved to be rather confusing. Well, you've also mentioned the Mabo case and was one of many landmark decisions handed down during your time on the court. And uh, I remember actually as an associate the day the ha case was handed down, going down in the lift with the judges and wondering to myself whether this would be a significant case. And then as a very young lawyer, wondering whether really a decision about the Merriam people for the Murray Islands would ever translate to the mainland. And of course, things have worked out beyond there. But I wonder whether you have any sense yourself in writing the judgment in that case and handing down the decision as to just what an important moment in Australian history that judgment would be. Yeah, well, I should say, first of all, the main judgment was written by Sir Gerard Brenner. I'm sorry he's not here tonight. Um, and I agreed with that judgment, and Justice McHugh and I made some comments about the judgment and about the effects of the judgments overall. But I was conscious that uh, Mabo would provoke controversy. What surprised me was that that controversy didn't arise for six months. The reason for that was there was an upcoming election shortly after the delivery was handed down and neither major political party wanted to run the risk of making the Mabo decision an issue in the election. So it was only after the election uh, that the storm broke upon us, like the typhoon or tornado that hit South Australia last week. Um, and that really is the explanation. I must say that the controversy, when it did arise, uh, was greater than I thought it would be. Uh, I hadn't thought, for example, that people would be saying, well, your backyard isn't safe. Indigenous people will be climbing over the back fence and staking it out. And of course, that was nonsense. But that's what some of the extreme comments uh, remarked at the time. And did you have a sense in handing down decisions, whether it be in Mabo or the great federalism cases of the 1980s, that you were trying to fashion a particular view of what nation we should be or the extent to which those policy considerations are helping to drive your own development of the legal doctrine? No, I didn't really have um, a shape uh, an idea of the shape of the nation or driving the shape of the nation. But I did have a strong idea that um, it was essential that the Commonwealth uh, had control of certain areas. I can best explain it this way. 
when I was a boy, uh, by and large, every activity that was touched by government was state controlled. Um, for example, the only impact that the Commonwealth had on the ordinary citizen in the days of my youth was the post office, um, the Commonwealth income tax and the sales tax, uh, and defence. Otherwise, all activities were controlled by the state. Transport, health, education, and in those fields, the Commonwealth had no intrusion or impact at all. Now, that has all changed. When we think about government these days, we are really thinking primarily about the Commonwealth Government. Well, it's and changed in part because of the decisions you helped hand down in the 1980s. Well, that's true, but it was happening long before that. If you go back to the uniform tax cases during the war, if you go back to the loan agreements in the 1930, the states had really surrendered or lost financial control. So the states, to take up the words prophetic words of Alfred Deakin, the first Prime Minister of Australia, or the second Prime Minister of Australia, um, the Constitution ultimately tied the states to the chariot wheels of the Commonwealth financially. And I, I suppose as a judge, why was it that you saw it as desirable to fashion a constitutional system that turned that on its head. And of course, it was already happening, particularly in the tax area. But why was it? Why did you take that view, say, as opposed to Sir Harry Gibbs, with whom you had many legal battles in the 1980s, where he took a quite different view on those issues? So I'm wondering why you thought it was desirable to go in that direction. I suppose the best example is the Tam is the Tasmanian Dams case, uh, where he and I took opposite views. Now, I thought it was essential that the Commonwealth had unfettered power to play a full part as a nation in, the partic in partici participation of the activities of the community of nations. He took the view that to allow the Commonwealth to have legislative power over something that was happening in Australia was a violation of the federal compact. He also took the view that uh, really uh, Australia's participation in World Heritage Convention arrange arrangements uh, would have little impact at all, and we were just as well off outside that. Now, I disagreed with all that, and I certainly disagreed with the proposition that this would lead to Commonwealth control in a whole area of cases. And I think that view has proved right, I can't think of any example where the Commonwealth has entered into an international convention for the purpose of just having legislative domestic power in Australia. And were there any particular things in your life that led you to that view that um, this was the appropriate result in the Tasmanian Dams case? For example, your time as a Solicitor General, was that, did that have an influence upon how you subsequently viewed the interpretation of the Constitution? Well, that, that's a question that I find very difficult to answer. It is true to say that when I became Solicitor General, uh, I worked in the company of lawyers uh, who certainly had little time for state rights. Indeed, they used to sarcastically refer to the sovereign state of Victoria, referring to Victoria's legal advisers, who, they, who my associates in the Attorney General's department regarded as people who are putting forward the idea that Victoria was a sovereign state, like a United States state, for example. Uh, now, uh, probably it is true to say that in the days when I was Solicitor General, I formed a view about what was appropriate in terms of Commonwealth power. Um, but as I say, it's a hard question to answer. Fair enough. <laughs> During your time as a, as a judge, particularly during your tenure as Chief Justice, many important decisions were handed down and they, they rocked the boat. I mean, the Mabo case was a good example, the implied freedom of political I'd communication. I'd prefer to say they set the boat on a clear <laughs> and proper course. Well, maybe that is also true. And, uh, but, of course, there was a, from some quarters, there was a fierce counter-reaction as well. And the court, as it has been in other periods of its time, has been subject to, then to fierce criticism. And 
That include that empty term that the court was activist, and your judgments were sometimes singled out for that, but sometimes there were less generous descriptions. Why, uh, why single my judgments out? There were other judgments. Well, one among many, one among <laughs> many. I think it's particularly as Chief Justice, of course, that uh, the Mason Court was a term that was used at that point. So whether or not it's a fair description, it's often the case that the Chief Justice is singled out sometimes. But others, for example, were less temperate in their criticism. They described your court as being an unfaithful servant of the Constitution, a pathetic self-appointed group of kings and queens, gripped in a mania for progressivism, or said to be plunging Australia into the abyss. And uh, here we have been completely over the top much of this criticism. I I'm wondering how you responded to that. Did I mean, no person could be completely impervious to that sort of quite significant political criticism. Did that it affect your work and that of the court, or were you able to go on in spite of some of those comments? By the way, you've missed out on one epithet that was particularly nasty. Somebody described us as seven pissants. Yes. <laughs> yes. I think it was uh, Graham Campbell, a Labor member, yes. <laughs> uh, but the answer to this question is that... Uh, and I, I can't speak for everyone in the court, but I'm sure I can speak for most members of the court. Um, judges uh, are aware of criticism. Judges don't dismiss criticism. Uh, they have a look at criticism and they evaluate, evaluate it. Uh, but in relation to the decisions to which you refer, the judges weren't deterred by criticism. They remained undeterred, and that's because uh, they were convinced that they were right. And, I mean, I have no doubt that some judges, in the light of the controversy about Mabo, uh, thought to themselves, well, were we right about this? But uh, for my part, I never had the slightest doubt that we were right, and I think uh, the majority members of the court, um, for can't speak exclusively for everyone, but uh, I think, broadly speaking, they took the same view that I now take. And of course, it's significant that not a single one of those decisions has been overturned, um, either by a subsequent court. No, that is true. A, a few final questions before we open it up to, to other questions from the audience. Um, I wonder, looking back on your career at the High Court and, and in other contexts, whether there are particular reforms or innovations that you think are overdue or that you'd like to see made in Australia? Well, I, I've always been a strong believer in human rights. And I recognise that uh, in Australia the view has been taken, or seems to have been taken, uh, that we don't need either a constitutional or a statutory Bill of Rights. Uh, personally, I would be against a constitutional Bill of Rights, but uh, I don't see the same objections to a statutory Bill of Rights. But recognising the opposition to that, I still think there is a case for having statutory protection of certain rights. Uh, and I've always been a believer in civil and political rights, not in economic rights. I don't think courts can handle economic rights. But uh, there, are, there, are two, there are two areas of rights that I think need protection. One is freedom of speech and freedom of expression. I think uh, recognition of them is absolutely essential to a working democracy. And I think Due process rights are vitally important. Now, the High Court has done a lot in recent times to enshrine due process rights in Chapter 3 of the Constitution, and I think the Court ought to be applauded for that. Uh, as far as freedom of expression uh, and freedom of information are concerned, uh, I think that would lead one to take the view that 18C and 18D of the Racial Discrimination Act ought to be reformed, and I would favour a reform along the lines suggested by Judge Sackville. Yeah. That is a change in the wording and a criterion that set, as it were, objectivity rather than subjectivity as the test. In other words, you don't look to the effect on an individual of language, you look to what a reasonable individual uh, would, as it were, sustain or think about it. Um, and as for freedom of information, I think that may be 
just as important. Uh, I don't agree with some of the restrictions that have been placed upon uh, freedom of information or even freedom of discussion. Uh, take, for example, the detention centres. Um, and I think if you look at the operation of the Commonwealth Freedom of Information Act, uh, you find that that's not as been, has not been as successful as it should have been. And I think if you look at the recent decision of the full court of the federal court in Dreyfus and Brandis, you can see we're still confronted with a situation where governments take every possible objection to providing information. Um, by and large, politicians are always uh, enthusiastic about freedom of information when they're in opposition. When they're in government, they take a different view. <laughs> and in 1995, after 23 years, you, you retired from the High Court, uh, but you hadn't had enough of judicial service at that point. You joined the Hong Kong Court of Final Appeal and, of course, served on that court for a very long period of time. Um, can you tell us a bit about that experience and how it compared to your judicial service in Australia? Well, I found that fascinating. Uh, first of all, the Hong Kong Court of Final Appeal is like the High Court of Australia. It's a constitutional court and a court of final appeal, as its name signifies. It's a constitutional court in the sense that it interprets the basic law, which is a statute of the National People's Congress agreed upon with the United Kingdom and sets out, uh, as it were, the rights and powers and indeed the rights of citizens of Hong Kong because it's got uh, protection of human rights, constitutional protection of human rights, uh, really on two bases which I needn't go into now. Um, but it is a remarkable constitution because Article 158 provides that the interpreter of the basic law is the Standing Committee of the National People's Congress in Beijing and it provides that uh, that uh, power of interpretation is delegated to the courts of Hong Kong in the adjudication of cases in Hong Kong. Uh, but um, it means that the Standing Co Committee can issue interpretations which are binding on the courts of Hong Kong, uh, and that power of interpretation extends to quite a large area of the provisions of the basic law and this uh, mechanical provision which requires the Court of Final Appeal in Hong Kong to refer certain questions to the Standing Committee in Beijing before pronouncing judgment. And in one case, we did that uh, the first time that's been done, and that met some, with some criticism in Hong Kong, but I imagine it was greeted with applause in Beijing. Um, but the Hong Kong Court I think faces some serious questions in the future which yet remain undecided. Uh, whether it can exercise jurisdiction over the validity of Chinese mainland statutes, that's a question which really hasn't arisen so far. And another question that hasn't arisen is whether or not the Chinese uh, political entity, the Chinese government can be in, can be interpleaded in the courts of Hong Kong. The Chinese government doesn't submit to the court's jurisdiction in the mainland, and it's unlikely to accept the jurisdiction of the courts of an autonomous region, or a special administrative region like Hong Kong. Now, they present difficulties for the future. Well, Sir Anthony, you, uh, you did retire from the High Court in 1995 at age 70 because that was the mandatory age that was imposed by the referendum in 1977. I just wonder if that mandatory retirement age had not been there, would you still be on the High Court today, 21 years later? Uh, I doubt it. Uh, but I, there was also a question in my mind as to whether or not, having been appointed a judge of the High Court before the Constitution was amended, I could assert a right to be still sitting on the High you Court as a judge, not as Chief Justice, but as a judge. And I used to say to Justice Gummo, if I asserted that right, it would mean that his appointment to the court was invalid. 
He didn't think that was very amusing. <laughs> I'm sure he didn't. <laughs> Well, thank you. We have some time now for questions from the audience, and we've got a couple of roving mics of people who uh, can help you be heard. So we'll just put up your hand if you'd like to ask a question. I'll take a few people. So we might start with a question here, just down the front, and then, yes, we'll go to a question there. If you can just maybe just mention your name as you ask the question too, please. Sure. My name's Robert Hardy. Sir Anthony, thank you for that uh, presentation. You touched on this a moment ago, but I wonder whether you might briefly, if you can, Referring to the Constitution and the 128 sections which are there now, if you could change three things, if you were back in the late 19th century drafting our founding document, what would you change and what would you perhaps enhance? But, but principally, what would, you, what would you do differently if you were the one writing the document based on your um, experience? Uh, well, I'm, I'm not so sure that I would change sections as... Uh, to include provisions that would clarify something. Um, but I certainly would contemplate the possibility of a change to section 128 uh, to enable easier amendment of the Constitution. Uh, another thing I would do, I think, is to include a provision in the Constitution uh, which, as it were, uh, avoided the complexity that we now have in relation to federal jurisdiction. It seems to me that federal jurisdiction is an extremely complex concept. And we have had cases, Momchilovich is an example of it, uh, where it's only when the case gets to the High Court that it is recognised that the case is one involving federal jurisdiction. And that was picked up by the members of the High Court in Momchilovich. It hadn't occurred to the lawyers in the case or to the Victorian Court of Appeal that that was so. Um, and then I think I would probably include uh, some provision that made it clear that judicial power extends beyond what has hitherto been recognised as the scope of judicial power. That would overcome the Momchilovich problem and the view that judicial power doesn't extend to a declaration of incompatibility with the Victorian statute, the Charter of Rights and Responsibilities. Would you go as far as also giving the High Court jurisdiction to give advisory opinions? No, I wouldn't go that far. Uh, because I can't help thinking there'd be a risk that the court would be swamped uh, with opinions uh, like, are the sections of the Trade Practices Act all valid? <laughs> now, I mean, in the early days, Canada that has a provision of that kind in its constitution was, when I say the early days, in go, going back a little in time, uh, it did have... Um, an advisory jurisdiction, and it was asked one or two questions uh, that I thought extended too far. But in recent times, there hasn't been any request at all. So uh, maybe if the High Court had an advisory jurisdiction, it would attract the politicians to begin with, but then they'd lose interest. <laughs> yes, we've got a question here. Um, roughly about... 40 years ago, you and um, Sir John Kerr um, handed down the Kerr report, which saw a significant reform to our administrative law system, and it was based on the notion of um, increasing executive accountability. And roughly now, 40 years later, we have several academ academics, uh, many legal academics, including Cheryl Sanders or Gabriel Elby, pointing out to the fact that um, executive accountability or the scope of executive power is growing. So with that in mind, um, how would you see a reform to our administrative law system to encourage um, more st stringent um, executive accountability um, process? Can you? Yes, so how, what reforms would you see to the administrative law system to deal with the growth of executive power? To deal with the? Uh, to deal particularly with, um, well, I think, I think the question is, uh, where we've seen a great growth in executive power over recent years, how would you perhaps rein that in or change that through administrative law reform? Well, I, I think that's a very difficult question. Um, 
I, I, I'm not sure that uh, it shouldn't be left to the legislatures to deal with that situation. I think it might be casting too much of a responsibility on the courts to do much about it. Uh, we do have one development that's occurred recently, and that is in relation to the executive power under Section 61 of the Constitution, where uh, the High Court seems to have held, certainly the Chief Justice holds this view, um, that in many areas of executive power, you need statutory authority. Now, uh, that seems to me to go along the lines that you are suggesting. Whether it goes far enough, perhaps, remains to be seen. But I'd prefer to pursue that line than suggest that the courts ought to take other action, that is, action other than, as it were, asserting that there ought to be statutory power to cover uh, the executive action in question. Thank you. There's a question there. Uh, Sir Anthony, you've extolled the, uh, the virtues of uh, freedom of expression. Uh, uh, freedom of expression, of course, is a very wide uh, berth. Uh, we've just had uh, recently in Malaysia uh, some Australians expressing their view on the victory of David Ricardo uh, winning the uh, Formula One in Malaysia. I understand also in Victoria uh, they have uh, outlawed uh, the freedom of expression by mooning would you, if you're still on the High Court, um, hold uh, or perhaps uh, overrule uh, the Victorian legislation preventing freedom of expression by mooning, or do you think that is uh, not an appropriate uh, avenue for freedom of expression? <laughs> so I think the question is, how far would you like to see freedom of expression <laughs> particularly to people who moon, pull down their pants and reveal their bottoms. I think there ought to be a limit on freedom of speech. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, I think there ought to be a number of limits on freedom of speech. Um, I, I don't, although I subscribe to freedom of speech and I think that the Racial Discrimination Act ought to be reformed, there must be some limits on freedom of speech. Indeed, the law recognises that. For example, defamation is uh, a limit on freedom of speech. And for centuries, blasphemy was a limit on freedom of speech. And for many decades, we've had the offence of offensive behaviour, which has been watered down by decisions which hold that conduct previously regarded as offensive is not offensive. So you've got to recognise there are some limits to freedom of speech. And certainly the one you have in mind, I think, is one that ought to be seriously considered. So I think Sir Anthony's ducked the mooning question. But, uh, yes. Um, after your view of Section 92 prevailed in Colin Whitfield, Sir Barwick, by then, of course, retired from the High Court, was still quite critical of that view. Did you then, and do you now, have... And I, um, a view about what the appropriate public role of a retired judge is? And do you ever feel that you can go too far in expressing a view about the, what the current court is doing? Uh, no, I, by and large, I would stick with the view that uh, we enunciated in Cole and Whitfield. Of course, that's been taken a little further by the present High Court. Uh, they have translated it into what might be described as competition law, competition effect. Uh, I don't have any objection to that. It seems to me that that's probably a logical development. Um, I think that's all I'd say in response to your question. Sir Anthony, what about uh, the other part of the question? Do you think there are any limits upon the contributions you or other judges can make post-retirement about the work of the High Court? Well, I think that's difficult. Um, I do sometimes make comments, but I always feel inhibited in making comments on High Court decisions, partly because I was a former Chief Justice. Um, but I have written articles... Uh, 
and made speeches, for example, on proportionality, um, which I think is very interesting. That is proportionality, particularly in the area of freedom of political communication. Um, there is a divide on the court uh, between the majority and Justice Gagler. I think there's a lot to be said for Justice Gagler's view. Um, but there is a majority the other way. Uh, and it remains to be seen, I think, whether the majority are prepared to modify their view in some way. But as it stands, they have adopted what I'd call the Germanic view of proportionality. Thank you. Is there another question? Yes, I think up the back is there. Thank you. Thank you so much for a beautiful talk tonight. Um, mine's quite a simple question. On In February 9 this year at in um, federal parliament, Bill Heffernan called for a federal judicial commission. Do you think there is a need in Australia for a federal judicial commission? Now, do you mean a federal judicial commission in terms of participating in the appointment process of federal judges? I think in, in, in terms of Bill's um, request was the need to review the conduct of the judicial, um, federal judicial body. Well, I've got divided views on that. Um, as things currently stand, I think the present system is working. I don't think you can point to outstanding examples of misconduct on the part of judges that calls for remedial action that hasn't been taken. Uh, on the other hand, I must say, if you go back to the Murphy affair, it seems to me that the court uh, would have avoided a good deal of controversy if in fact there was a commission uh, to which that matter could have been referred with a recommendation coming from that commission uh, rather than the matter becoming a political football as it did become. As long as you keep the Murphy example in mind as a possible event that might occur in the future, I think there's a good deal to be said for a standing commission. We've got time for one more question. Um, regarding the advice given by um, your colleague, um, Justice Barrick, in the Constitutional Crisis 1975, did you think that's a terrible mistake? Thank you. <laughs> Do I think what about that? Do you think it was a mistake by Sir Garfield Bowie to give the advice that he gave in 1975 to Sir Well, uh, I don't think I ought to comment on what Sir Garfield Barwick did on that occasion, but I think you can probably divine my attitude uh, from the answer that I gave to George Williams when George asked me, with the benefit of hindsight, what's your view now? Now, uh, I think, uh, without my mentioning Sir Garfield, discussing what he did, you're entitled to draw an inference. <laughs> Well, can I, Sir Anthony, can I just round things off with one last question? I mean, you've had a very long career in the law with many varied and different roles. Are, are there any particular judgments or achievements that, as you look back, of which you're particularly proud? Yes, Colin Whitfield. <laughs> uh, partly because uh, Sir John Latham said that when he died, uh, Section 92 would be written on his heart, having regard to all the trouble the court had had in deciding Section 92 cases. It is said, by the way, and I don't know whether this is accurate, that Colin Whitfield uh, overruled uh, 140 previous decisions of the High Court without explicitly doing so. Now, I think that's an exaggeration, but it is true to say that what Colin Whitfield said in terms of the principle of interpretation that it laid down on Section 92 departed from anything that had been said in previous judgments. Thank you. Well, look, I'll invite Sean Brennan to round out the proceedings.
Well, that's a, a long journey we've gone on from um, uh, the early decades of the 20th century to the early decades of the 21st century. Uh, thank you, George, first, for conducting tonight's proceedings with your customary ease and professionalism, as well as, uh, as the experience and expertise that you brought to, to your role in the conversation. And uh, my particular thanks to you, Sir Anthony, um, You've done the Gilbert and Tobin Centre and our law school a great honour by agreeing to participate in this open dialogue about sometimes personal and sometimes momentous events in a long and, and very distinguished life of public service and for offering your um, frank and, and very interesting perspectives on a whole series of important public law issues and, and some controversies. It's also been a great pleasure to have uh, here with us uh, Lady Mason, who has obviously played a, a very important role in the life uh, that's been described tonight, and uh, also the other members of the Mason family. Thank you very much again for attending. Uh, Sir Anthony, I will hand this to you in a moment after we've formally closed, but please do accept this uh, <laughs> as a small token of our appreciation. Uh, and I do ask you all to join me in again thanking George and particularly Sir Anthony for tonight's conversation. <laughs>